guys, welcome back. I'm Sidra Kaluska and this is An Artist's Life. So I'm going to show you today some things that I do to start my plants for my garden. Um, this isn't how I have always done things. This is how I've evolved over several years of getting things started. Um, my setup is definitely very different from how I initially started. Um, we used to rent a house that had a beautiful south-facing window. It was the only feature of the house that we actually missed. Um, but since it was a south-facing window, it got light all day long. It was really warm, and so it was actually an excellent place to start seeds. I don't have a good southern-facing window here, and we also have two cats. And they decided at one point that my seed starting trays were a wonderful place to take a nap on which is not very helpful in getting plants to grow so um i've had to come up with some ways to get around the for one not having a really good light source two making sure my cats don't mess with it and three trying to stay in a reasonable budget range because the sky is far from the limit as far as i'm concerned so i'm trying to do things that are easy simple and affordable and i know um, if any of you guys are flipping through catalogs or other sorts of seed or gardening catalogs that there are definitely a lot of products out there. Some of them are really helpful. Some of them seem really cool, but the price tag associated with them can come with a big ouch factor. Um, sometimes it's reasonable, sometimes it's not, but honestly, I feel that a lot of the things that they're trying to market to us at this point, and it is marketing, they want you to buy those products. That's one reason why they look so cool. Um, they want you to spend money and well, it's not always necessary. So I'm going to show you what I have, give you some ideas, um, give you some budget ideas as well. So let's swivel this way. So this is my plant setup box right now. Um, I have several different things going on in here. Um, one thing that people really try to promote to you at this point are grow lights. Grow lights can be really helpful and they do produce, um, or at least some of them do produce slightly different waves than say what I have here. Um, these are just shop lights. I have a warm and a cool bulb in each. So that gives me the full range of spectrum as far as light rays go. And it's actually worked for me really well. I've been doing this for, I think, three years now. So I'm really happy with this setup and with your fluorescent bulbs, they do produce heat. Not a lot of heat, but enough heat that it can make a nice warm environment. Um, they are cool enough that I can place them directly on these plastic lids and I don't have to worry about them melting. Um, and they can also come in contact with plant leaves as well and you don't have to worry about the plant leaves burning. If you try to use a standard incandescent bulb, it will melt a hole in the plastic. I have done that once by accident. Luckily I was here and I caught it very quickly. I just had a bulb plugged in to the side and it was touching one of the containers. It actually melted a hole in the side of the plastic tote which kind of ended up working out for me because now I have a ventilation hole on one side, which is also something that's very important. But um, your grow lights are very expensive, very pricey, and it's not necessarily something that you really need to do. Um, in my upstairs studio, I do have two lemon trees growing that I started from seed, and it's in a southern facing room. so. I do get light all day, but it's not direct, and the quality of light isn't quite what it should be for those. And so I do have a um, grow light in there, and it has really made a big difference for those. But one other thing to keep in mind if you are putting grow lights in your house, 
is that they do produce a full spectrum light. That means that they can also produce light damaging rays too. So if you have things hanging on your wall or fabrics or whatever, it can cause some damage that way. And also reading the package, it explicitly says to never look directly into the bulb when it's on. So it can damage your eyes as well. Just want to keep that in mind. Um, so the shop lights, these bad boys, I think I got them on clearance. So maybe they ran about $25 a piece. I wanted specifically ones that I can plug in versus ones that have to be hardwired. Ones that have to be hardwired for me is just going to be trickier to do. I wanted something that I can just plug in and unplug as I need them. I have uh, an outlet set up over here, an extension cord, and a surge protector. So I have several things plugged in there all at once and I just wanted to make it easier to pick and choose like what I need plugged in because um, I do not keep everything running at the same time and I'm going to be changing this up a little bit as the season proceeds and their growth also continues. So. Let me kind of go over what I have here a little bit better. Let me get a sec. Okay, so one thing that you definitely need is a good source of light. So if you don't have your window, you do have to get additional light source. And even if you do have a pretty good window, your seeds are going to start veering in one direction. So you need to constantly rotate them like once a day or so. Um, but even giving them supplemental lighting will have them grow even better. And so something that I've started using, which may not necessarily be a must, it depends on how warm your house is. I have started using uh, heat mats. They're these black mats right here. So I have four of those. Um, I do not have every single one of them plugged in this second um, because it depends on what seedlings I have in each box. But um, with being in my basement, um, my floors are pretty cold. I took a temperature gun to them and they usually run around 60 to 63 degrees. And if you check your seed packets, a lot of them prefer temperatures that start to get into the 70s, maybe even 80s, depending on what you're growing. If you're looking at doing like leafy greens, lettuces, and something in the cooler range like um, cabbage, and broccoli and those types of things, this temperature 50 to 60 degrees is actually perfect for starting those. A little bit of heat will give them a bit of a kick in the pants, but you don't want them to get too hot if they start to get in the 80, 90 range. Um, that's when they start to want to bolt, which is go to seed. So if you try to initially uh, initiate that hot sequence early when they're just starting to germinate, it's probably going to be a little bit more of a problem. However, if you're dealing with things like tomatoes and peppers, they absolutely love and thrive on the heat. So if I tried starting it on a 60 degree floor, they're probably not going to germinate, or if they do, it's going to be really slow growth. Um, but by introducing them to heat, it really gets them going and makes them very happy. So um, heat mats, not 100% necessary, but it is a good investment. I would shop around for those. Um, these heat mats, I think, were probably around in the $20 range, but I have seen places selling them as much as $40 a pop. So I would definitely do some research, do some shopping around. Um, sometimes, I think it's just one of those things that people are really trying to market and gouge prices on. Um, I did notice on these heat mats, they were recommending that you don't leave them unattended. So that may be something to consider. Um, it could also just be to cover their liability because 
if it say did start a fire and you weren't watching it they could say well you weren't home and we told you to be home while they were on so um just something you need to do i've left these unattended they've been perfectly fine i've also monitored the temperature on them to make sure that they don't get excessively hot and it just feels like mildly warm but that warm will buffer inside of a box so it's not going to get hot enough to burn anything but it's definitely going to create a nice environment in there um and let's see so i have these in totes so these are clear plastic totes i think i just picked those up at target um i think they're maybe the 36 gallon size can't 100% remember, but I've used them for three years now as well, and I've been really, really happy with them. Um, they're like eight or nine bucks, whereas if you're actually looking to get one of those greenhouse starter kits, they're super expensive, and they're typically really disappointingly flimsy. Um, I did start off with just one of those seed starter trays with the raised plastic dome, I think it was a Burpees brands. They were maybe $15. It did come with some seed starter soil, but it did not come with any seeds or anything like that. Um, but it only was good enough to last one season. And by the time it was ready to basically plant those seeds, the plastic roof was starting to crack and it just it wasn't really what I needed. Um, it doesn't really allow room for larger plants, so as your plants grow, you're going to need to transplant them into something bigger. But if the space doesn't allow you to do something like that, you're kind of stunting their growth early on instead of giving them a nice environment to grow big and strong before you put them out in your garden. So that's something that you might want to consider. Um, but again, these are so cheap. Why not go with them? Um, these are... See, that's number five plastic and number five plastic is supposed to be one of the most stable as far as um, it holding up to light and heat and weather so use them for several seasons start them inside and later when it starts to warm up I do move them inside and they've held up really really well um, but if you don't have the budget, if you don't have the room for those right now, or if you're not sure if you really want to make an investment at this point, and buying some of this equipment can be a little bit of an investment. If it's something that you're not really sure you want to get into right now, you can definitely get away with essentially buying almost nothing. So, let's see. Right over here in this container. Um, that is from a large pack of lettuce. I have two containers, one dome on top and one just on the bottom that has the soil in it. Okay, switched my location so I can talk about this better. So I have this dome right here. Um, I'll just lift that up. You can see that it has built up moisture on the inside so that, no that lets you know that there is some heat in there, which is good. You want some heat and you do have, have moisture too, which is good because you don't want it to be dry in there. I'm just going to take that off. And if you have um, wires in here, which I do, you want to be careful about not having your moisture drip around because you do not want that to get on your exposed electrical wires. So. What I have in here um, is a little bit of an experiment. Um, not everyone knows this, and I personally just found out about this last year, that pumpkin leaves and squash leaves are edible. And they're actually usually pretty tasty. So um, I saved all of my various squash and pumpkin seeds this year with the aim of doing microgreens. So um, what I have right here, these were from a delicata candy stick um, squash, which is really lovely. Um, highly recommend that variety of squash. The only problem is it's not super great with um, powder mildew. 
but it tastes really good. So um, I did taste one of these and the flavor was vaguely reminiscent of um, your romaine. It had that ever so slight bitterness that a romaine does and that um, a little bit of an earthy flavor. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting that took me a little while to figure out what exactly I was tasting was it does have an aftertaste reminiscence of raw yellow squash. Um, it's something that I haven't had since I was a little kid, so it took me a little while to figure out what that taste was because it was familiar, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. So I've been happy with these. I would definitely eat these raw. I could put it in a mixed green salad, and I'm pretty sure that my husband probably wouldn't even know that I put them in. Um, so bitterness level was perfectly fine. I was happy with them. I'll show you in a second, but I tried another variety, which was from a sweet pumpkin um, that was basically a small pie pumpkin that had a really high sugar content. Um, so I thought that the greens would be pretty good and I tasted one of those and it was horrifically bitter. And I can tolerate some pretty bitter vegetables, but that one was very, <laughs> very bitter. It was rather surprising that there was such a big difference between the two, even though they're so closely related. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and leave those, and I definitely won't eat them raw, but I will give them a go in cooking after they get a little bit bigger to see if maybe it would still be good as a micro cooking green, um, just not something that I would actually want to consume raw. So really easy container here. This one, I did not put any holes in the bottom. So if you don't have holes in the bottom, you need to be very careful about watering. You want the soil to be moist, but you don't want it to be wet. And the reason is if it's wet, then your seeds are probably going to start rotting versus germinating. You want it to be moist so there's moisture for them to emerge but you don't want it to be so bad that they just get soggy and have lots of issues. Um, excessive moisture also can induce mold growth or other bacterial or fungal kind of infections in your soil and so if you keep it too wet you're just kind of promoting that growth especially because you're giving it a nice warm enclosed environment um, something you can help something you can do to help stave that off a little bit is I can leave the lid off for maybe a couple hours a day just let it vent out a little bit um, before putting it on I just want to make sure that it's not going to dry out um, another method that you can do, which I have over here, I'm really excited about these. These are canna lilies. Um, I started these from seed. Yay! Usually when you're talking about lilies, you buy bulbs or sections of rhizome, which is a chunk of roots. Um, but you can also grow them from seed. It can be tricky though, because different lilies may require different kinds of environments for germination. One thing that's tricky about canna lily seeds in particular is their exterior is super hard. It's almost woody. So um, if they're just left out in nature, most of them don't germinate um, unless it's in kind of a sandy rocky environment and the seeds are kind of rocking back and forth which causes the surface to start to erode at which point you could see germination so in order to get these to germinate i actually took a dremel tool and drilled a little hole through the shell on each of the seeds before i put them in the soil and set that and um, it's looking like my germination rate is pretty awesome. So I'm really happy about that. And this is, again, a super cheap, super easy way to grow them. Um, I knew that the lilies need a 
very high moisture to start because that exterior seed is so hard there needs to be a lot of moisture to soften it up and to give the lilies basically the capacity to break through their shells in order to germinate. It's not usually that intense for your generic vegetables for sure that's not something that you typically do for vegetables but um, for these it was definitely necessary but very effective. So what I have done here is I wanted to make sure that they were really moist but I didn't want them to be in a sopping pile of mud. So I have two um, potato salad containers. The top one where the seeds and soils are sitting I have five holes drilled in. I have one in each corner and one in the middle and just slipped in another container underneath. So if there's excessive moisture in the top container, it will drain down into the bottom container. And that also helps get a tiny bit of airflow going in there too. So that'll help keep that soil better as well. And um, this was just some sort of deli container that I had from something. And I've just been putting that on top to help keep a little bit of the heat in there, a little bit of the moisture. But as you can see, it has open sections on the side. So that's going to allow airflow in there, which is also something that's important and good to have. Okay, so if you're trying to cut out plastics, which I completely understand, and I'm kind of in that boat too, uh, something else you can do are use your milk carton containers. So these are, these are made from wood pulp. They have um, I'm guessing some sort of wax liner on them, which makes them impermeable to water as long as you don't damage the surface. So this is something that you really need to keep in mind because if I'm putting this on my heat mats, which are not supposed to get wet, I need to make sure that when I water this, the water isn't going to come out through the bottom. So if I have scratched the inner surface of that, that does leave um, fissures in the body where moisture can start working its way through and then from there it can start eroding from the inside. So um, just need to make sure that you're careful when you do it this way. Something I've also done is you can see here I have not planted all the way up to the edge. I've left about an inch maybe half an inch on top. That will prevent me um, from when I'm watering it, it'll make sure that this upper edge, which is exposed, stays dry. Because if I start getting this wet a lot, that's going to encourage that to break down. So by protecting that exposed edge, that helps protect the integrity of the entire container. Um, I will be moving these outside later have some carrots right here that I just had from grocery store carrots. I just chopped the top off, have it in the dirt, and it's growing right now. Um, carrot greens are edible and actually make a really tasty pesto. So it's something else that you can add to, say, a winter basement garden. So you can have a little bit of something um, to work with. And again, if you're buying a bag of carrots, if you top, cut off the top inch, you're not really losing anything and it's not um, per se an extra expense. What I have next to it um, is a sweet potato. So I have two little starts here. It's actually from the same plant. One of them was getting a little straggly already so I just cut that off, put it in the dirt. It's definitely already rooted. I'm giving it a light tug and I can feel that there's a lot of give, or I should say, not any give, it's very sturdy in there, which is a wonderful sign. So um, I'm going to be growing sweet potatoes in my garden. These are actually from sweet potatoes that I grew last year that had started sprouting. So if you can kind of perpetuate some of the things that you have started growing, it may be an initial expense up front, but if you take the right steps, you can kind of keep that going so you don't have to reinvest every year. Okay, another thing that I think is important to have is a basic spray bottle. 
Um, it helps you to keep things moist, like if you need to spot check something. Pouring a lot of water on top of your soil can be problematic, especially if you have tiny, delicate seedlings. You can kind of smash them, um, sometimes even snap their stems. So spray bottles are pretty helpful, and you can get them pretty cheap. Um, for right now, I also have milk jugs that I save. Um, we have two dehumidifiers down here. The humidity in the basement can be pretty high, and we just didn't want that to cause any mold issues. So when we empty out the dehumidifier, we save the water, and then I can water my plants. So that's free too. Um, this isn't much to look at right now, and honestly, I was a little concerned about it. Friends gave me some flowering ginger bulbs, and I'm really excited to see them grow. And they've been in the pot for, I think, two weeks now, and I'm not seeing anything. But I dug under the dirt a little bit to check the rhizome, and the rhizome still looks really healthy. So that's a good sign. Okay, so I just have another, um, this is just a lettuce container. I'm just sitting on top of that to help keep a little bit of the moisture and a little bit of the heat. Um, this one is on a heat mat, and of course it is in a standard pot, um, which most of my things are not. So, I'm kind of in a position that, to show you the rest of it, I'm going to have to take a second and move this out of the way so we can get forward. Okay, so we'll take a look in these boxes now. I just moved my lights and removed the lids. Um, when I have the lid on this box, this box is solid. It doesn't have the hole in it. So I try to make sure that the lid has maybe about an inch open on one end just so I can get a little bit of airflow in there because as we were talking about before, we don't want the moisture to get so great that it becomes a spot for mold growth. So giving it some ventilation helps kind of tap that off before it gets to be a problem. So what I have growing in here, I have several kinds of tomatoes. Um, I have a white cherry, I have a bumblebee sunrise, which is really fun. It's a multi-colored um, yellow and red tomato. It's really delightful. Um, a lot of cherry tomatoes have kind of a squishiness to the inside, but the the bumblebee sunrise was almost like a standard meaty tomato, but in a small form. So really enjoyed those. Peach tomatoes are also fun. They're yellow, sometimes with a red blush, and they're slightly fuzzy on the outside like a peach. And then I have... Um, Let's see, this is my Doe Hill Golden Bell Pepper. It's a miniature sweet. Um, they were really good. I was really happy with them the first year that we grew them. Last year the weather was weird and they just didn't produce a whole bunch. So I'm giving them another go. Um, have a Hungarian carrot, very spicy. A black check, um, also known as a purple jalapeno. Um, their spiciness is interesting. It's kind of a hit and miss. Sometimes they can be really mild and sometimes they can be super hot and kind of knock you on your face. Um, then I have a new pepper, new sweet pepper that I'm trying, a new hot pepper I'm trying. I have some Asian eggplants. Um, been kind of hit and miss with those, but I'm also going to try growing them covered this year. Apparently putting a row cover on them is supposed to really help with production. A red cherry tomato, some jalapenos, black cherry. Um, a new tomato that I have is a tigerilla tomato. It's also a multicolored red and yellow. Um, it's around the size of a golf ball to a baseball. So a little bit bigger than your cherries, but not as big as, say, a standard tomato. Um, and then I'm also trying a new Italian paste tomato that I'm very interested in. 
I'm trying to find varieties that will work well with my climate and with my growing conditions. I know we're dealing with some more extremes now, so this one said that it did really well one year when there was a drought and a flood in the same season. So I was like, yay, because that's kind of how the weather has been for us lately. Like super dry hot sections with intense wet sections. Um, so that's a new one. I also have some shallots that I saved seeds from one of my plants that went to seed last year. So see how those do. Shallots are considered, or at least this variety is considered to be a perennial onion, so you can save the bulbs and plant them another year and they'll divide, which is fun. So over here, these are the pumpkins that I was talking about. So surprisingly bitter, but they look so happy and healthy. Look how green they are. It's a lovely blue green. They're really lush. They look ridiculously happy, a couple of them it looks like. The seeds popped off. Um, also doing some radish microgreens over here. I have a couple new kinds of daikon that I was looking at, which is a Asian type of radish. They have a really long tapered root, almost like a carrot. Um, got a couple new varieties this year and I wanted to test them out in just a baby form first to see how maybe the greens taste because different greens even in the same family can have a different flavor or a different pungency. Um, one of them is a purple and one of them is a red and I'm starting now to see the color difference. I put half on one side, half on the other. Um, I have over here a, this is a red acre cabbage. So it's the first time I'm growing that. I really like cabbage. Um, I've had some trouble growing it in the past and I think I may have come up with a solution to help. One of the biggest problems in our area seems to be the cabbage caterpillar, which goes crazy and just eats everything. You'll have a beautiful plant one day and then skeletal leaves the next and you see these fat caterpillars all over the place. So. A little upsetting sometimes. Um, I don't use pesticides so I'm going to try putting some tool on top like um, basically the fabric that you use to fluff up a skirt or a wedding dress or something like that. Um, it's a very fine kind of meshy fabric and I was doing some rooting around for information and someone was recommending to use on top of your leafy greens that are really prone to getting this type of infestation because it's thin enough, light enough, and breathable enough that it doesn't build up any heat, um, it lets the moisture through, but it's strong and durable enough that the caterpillars can't get through to the actual um, plants in order to lay their eggs, which seems pretty awesome. So. We'll give that a go this year. I have some pak choy. I have a couple of different kinds of Asian mustard. One of them's a tatsui, um, which is actually also good in the fall and winter. That one is supposed to be good down to around 22 degrees Fahrenheit. So it can take some pretty hard freezes. You just wanna make sure that they're well established before you get to the winter. Um, some more mustard, and then I have two more kinds of onions over here. And I also have in the back here, this is something new that I'm pretty excited about. It's called a live pizza needle. So it's kind of like Something spiky had a love child with a tomatillo. Um, the fruit is red and small, smaller than your cher standard cherry tomatoes. It has a husky outside similar to a tomatillo, but it's also covered in thorns. It sounded really interesting, so I wanted to try it. 
But this is also an example of another freebie container that you can use to start your seats in. I have holes drilled in the bottom. I have three. I usually like doing things in sets of three as far as containers go. Um, one is usually not enough. One usually can still create kind of a um, uh, vacuum with one hole. If you have two holes, it can drain better, but three for me, um, I just seem to prefer it. Um, I know it gets good drainage, so if I need to water from above and there's too much, I know it'll drain out, but I can also water from the bottom so I can put it in a container that has water in it and just leave it. And I know it'll absorb enough water through the base as well. And then I don't have to worry about my seedlings getting wet. Um, cause sometimes, as I was saying, too much moisture can be a problem. And if you're getting your seed babies wet, that is also an invitation for mold or fungus infections, which we definitely don't want to have. Okay. So we have our cheap containers and our free containers. These seed trays, so these white seed trays I just got this year. It's something that I had been eyeing for a few years and just went, what the heck, why don't I go ahead and see this as an investment? Um, one thing that I don't like about the plastic, or there are a couple things I don't like about the plastic seed starter trays, is um, they're plastic. I don't want to use more plastic than is necessary, but they're also not durable. They're pretty much good for one season. So it's a lot of plastic waste. Um, you can't, since it's a thin plastic, they start to crumble sometimes or they can tear. And in order to reuse a container, you have to be able to sanitize it um, because you can have, you know, the mold spores or whatever else set up shop in your containers, but if it's something that you can't really wash or introduce the heat, you can't reuse it well. Um, or you can try, but it's a bit of a gamble because you could end up with an issue down the line and then you might be kicking yourself for it later. So what these are, they're foam. And yes, I was on the fence about buying a foam container because I'm not really big on the styrofoam either. But um, the final draw for these, there were a couple of them. It has a hole in the bottom, like a nice, a nice size solid hole, so it will get um, some air ventilation and water ventilation. These are technically um, can also be used hydroponically because since they're foam, they can float on the surface and the roots can extend outside of the container and the dirt in the cell into whatever kinds of um, water solution nutrients that they could float on. Um, I'm just using dirt because I'm I don't want to mess with a hydroponic system at this point um, because it's more work than some people think it might be. Um, anyway, so it is foam, but since it is foam, I can pour boiling water on it and sanitize these pretty easily, and they're really durable. They're supposed to be good for at least ten years. So I saw that as a good investment because there's going to be less waste. Um, since these cells are pretty compact and concise, I can actually get a lot more plants in this container than I could if I was using my yogurt cup containers because round versus square in a square container, you're going to be able to get more biomass in something of this setup. That being said, this is not going to be their final home. This is just their testing or starting off area. Um, I was doing one, two, three seeds, depending on the variety per cell. When it comes to the final transplant, I'll remove the plug. Um, depending how I'm feeling that day, I might just pinch off the two weaker or whatever amount is weaker in each cell just so that one plant is going to be living and then I'll transplant that into a larger container so it'll have more room to establish 
before I transfer it to its final outdoor home. Um, for the tomatoes, working with something that's a little bit more concise again, I'm actually going to be using these milk jugs and I cut off around the top two inches so it's a deeper square container. So I'm going to be putting my tomatoes in there. They'll fit into a rectangular space easily. Again, I'm not using the plastic. Didn't pay for the containers. Um, since this is more of a final home at that point and it's going to be in another container, I will drill some holes in the bottom of those because I do want them to drain. It does, it will have a plastic base that can catch that extra overflow. So I will give it that room at that point. Um, but that's basically what I have here. These, I found a actual hydroponic store that had a really good price. So I think I paid around 10 to $12 a piece for these foam trays. Um, I've seen them for as much as $25 per tray. And I actually had to trim up a little bit to get it in this box because they're really, they're pretty big trays. Um, so I would say shop around to look for them. It's again, one of those things that's a little bit of a price catch. People are trying to make money off of them because they sound really cool, but they are kind of cool. So, that's what we have here. One of the other draws for these is um, when you're looking at your standard plastic cell trays, they're basically the same diameter on the top as the bottom and your roots can really start to wrap around and it can be difficult to get the whole plant out of the bottom in particular because it's just one solid spherical shape that just doesn't want to come out of the container. These are pyramid shaped. So it tapers off toward the bottom, which makes it a lot easier to lift out. I, of course, haven't done that yet because this is the first time I'm using them. Uh, but they're supposed to be way easier to transplant and also do a lot less root damage. So this is, this is what I have going on. One additional thing that you've probably been seeing in the background but maybe haven't quite figured out what it is are these things. Um, I was trying to maximize the amount of light I have in this given space without um, doing a huge investment. So if you do look at some of those grow tents, which are really cool but also really expensive, frequently they're in the hundred dollar range. Um, it's kind of like a black fabric black fabric on the outside lined with a mylar facing so it's a mirror reflection so you can have a little bit of light but all of it's going to be continuously bouncing around on the inside so you're not losing any of that energy it's all staying contained and you'll have maximum absorption um so kind of ripping on that idea i bought some emergency mylar um camping blankets and I've just attached them to some cardboard sheets. Cardboard was free. Mylar blankets were around $1.50 a piece. I bought them on eBay. Um, it has helped a whole bunch. This whole area is just like a little glowing box. It could be better, but for the price, I think this was a really good idea. Um, it's pretty efficient and definitely way cheaper than a hundred plus dollar tent. Um, this exterior setup was less than 10 bucks. I had to go pick up the cardboard, um, got it for free at Michael's. The frame shop frequently has things that come in orders like to protect their mat boards or whatever. So I was just able to get some of those. I used some clips on the edge to keep those in place. One nice thing about this is too, is that I can expand it so I can shift this around as my plants need more space or as I'm starting more plants. Um, I guess the last thing I will talk about is making sure that you set up things kind of safe and easy. 
Um, doing anything with electrical that's also in combination with water, you want to be very careful. You don't want an outlet sitting in a puddle because that could cause some problems. So um, what I've done is try to make this as simple as possible because I don't like a lot of extra cords rummaging across the floor. Um, and if I want to pull a specific plug, I want to know where it's going to go before I'm like testing each one. Like, was that really that outlet or was it the next one over? So I have this set up very simply. This is my first heat mat, second, third, and my fourth, which I don't have plugged in because it's to my cooler crop. So I want that box to be warm, but not as warm as my tomato and pepper box. Um, and then I have my light plug in. The one that is in the back is first. The one that is in the front is last. So if I need to unplug, which I do unplug some of these things at night, I know which ones to unplug quite easily. I have the extra cable tied up with a large twist die. So that's not going to be anything that I need to trip on. And it keeps everything just really concise and organized. If that's not you, that's fine. Um, I honestly didn't have it set up this way last year and it was a little tricky trying to get around things and figure out what was what. So I came up with this, really happy with it. And I laid it to the side somewhere and I don't see it. Um, so you want to make sure that you have a good amount of light, but you don't want to give them too much light. One, problem is that some people think, well, if I leave the lights on 24-7, that's good for my plants. The answer is no. It's not good for your plants and you can actually kind of fatigue them. So um, the book that I'm reading now is recommending, say, no more than 12 to 14 hours of light. If you go over that, you're kind of doing overkill and you can actually start to decrease the production of your plants. If you are good about messing with lights, remembering that you need to do them, that's great. But if you are forgetful or if you go out of town frequently or have irregular work schedules, which can mess with your ability to turn things on and off, you can get a timer, which is awesome. So I was actually just going to plug this into the extension cord that has all of my cords in it. So um, for right now, I'm just doing it manually because my schedule allows me to do that. Later on though, I might be switching over to this and just programming it so it's set up for the right amount of hours. Right now, I'm leaving my heat mats on 24-7 but turning the lights off at night. After the seeds all germinate that I want, um, I'm going to start cutting the heat mat off at night and just um, let it go through a cool cycle. It more closely um, follows how it's going to the environment that it is outside, which enables them to grow a little bit better. So, um, but I want it to be nice and warm as they're establishing. So that's that. Hope this was helpful. Hope this was enjoyable. If you have any questions, comment below. Let me know. If you want to um, check out any of my other videos, go for that and also subscribe to my page. Hope you have a great day and take care. Bye!